Well, hello everyone and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia. And if you're not new here and you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, I hope you're doing splendidly. So today we're going to be talking about ancient libraries or rather kind of a brief history on libraries. Yesterday was World Book Day and I thought it'd be appropriate to finally get this darn video out. I've been popping it off for absolutely ages. So let's talk about libraries, how they came to be. I uh, kind of look at a few ancient libraries. There are a lot of them. We're not going to cover all of them. But I'm kind of going to show you the oldest few selection. And of course, we're going to be touching on the Library of Alexandria. Everyone wants to know about the Library of Alexandria. Did it burn down? What happened to it? All that jazz. So let's get into it. The libraries we know and use today are the product of rapidly evolving political and technological developments in the 20th century and are very different from the ancient ancestors. Today we know libraries as buildings housing a collection of books, manuscripts, journals and other sources of recorded information. There are several categories of libraries. We have public, academic, specialist, national and technically personal. Though most of us can't say the following regarding our personal libraries, the other kinds of libraries are responsible for housing updated information accessible to all library members and providing additional information services to them. However, in the ancient world, libraries weren't built with the intention of being a public resource. They became that way, but rather their original purpose was as a safeguarding hub for written documents. You see, in the ancient world, libraries were primarily archives or record rooms initially that protected important written documents, particularly historical records and religious and political texts of importance from accidental or purposeful damage and destruction. The first libraries, or rather archives, we know date back to 2600 BCE and contained the earliest form of writing clay tablets in cuneiform script. For those unfamiliar, cuneiform is an ancient writing system employing logosyllabic script and was used to write in several languages in the ancient Near East around 3400 BCE. Cuneiform involves using a reed to make impressions in clay and the method was developed developed by the Sumerians, whose culture and influence thrived beyond its original borders in the Mesopotamia during the 3rd millennium BCE. Nippur, Mesopotamia, now Iraq, was a religious city that played an important in the development of the world's earliest civilization. Though it didn't have a dedicated library, it had many temples and governmental buildings, in which there were thousands of Sumerian and Akkadian documents written on clay tablets. In 1888, the University of Pennsylvania sponsored the first American expedition to work in the Mesopotamia. The expedition worked in Nippur until 1900. During this time, the team found more than 30,000 cuneiform tablets and hundreds of other objects, primarily in temples and private houses. What's more fascinating is that the temples catalogued their tablets. These two cuneiform tablets I popped on the screen were found at Nippur, and each is inscribed with a list of Sumerian works of literature, in no apparent order, however, so that's where we have a difference with libraries and ancient archives. One of the tablets has 68 titles, and the other has 48 titles of works, and these tablets actually represent the earliest surviving literary or library catalogue of sorts. It's a predecessor to a more organised library, which we'll get into later. Similarly, a collection of Assyrian clay tablets of the 2nd millennium BCE were found in Tel El Amarna in Egypt in 1887. Tel El Amarna was the short-lived capital of ancient Egypt during the reign of Amentep IV. How the Assyrian clay tablets were found is vague and contradictory. So while some reports claim that they were discovered by a local woman and a group of farmers, other accounts indicate that they were actually uncovered during a private excavation, which ultimately made it very difficult for archaeologists to ascertain the precise location of their excavation. However, according to the locals' testimonies, evidence suggests that the tablets came from an ancient administrative office known as the Palace of the Correspondents of the Pharaoh, LPA. The discovery of these cuneiform tablets is important to note because Egypt is outside the area where cuneiform writing was developed, which testifies to the use of Mesopotamian script and the Akkadian language across the Eastern Mediterranean during this period. So before libraries were formally established, temples and administrative offices were used to store and protect valuable written documentation, whose destruction during wars or conflicts or governmental uprisings could cause irreparable damage. I mean, think of all the documents that you have in your life where they are very important to you and you need copies of them, physical copies, digital copies, etc. Imagine if someone just burnt them and got rid of them, there'd be no backup plan. Basically everything that happened in the ancient world. So if you think about every important document that ever existed in the ancient world, which they would need access to either for their own governmental or political reasons or purely for historical reasons, 
you need to protect the books. However, this does kind of lead us down a very interesting rabbit hole, which was the idea of like censoring history and the destruction of tablets or rather paper or papyri, etc. of the books. The earliest example we have of this kind of censorship was actually the burning of the books, which was carried out by imperial edict in China in 213 BCE. So Li Su, the Grand Chancellor of the Emperor Shi Huang Ti, a member of the Qin Dynasty, was actually the mastermind of the burning of the books plot. Though most people overlooked the Grand Counselor's role in this movement and placed fault squarely on the Emperor. However, Li Su was a shrewd politician who proposed several important reforms which were carried out, including the abolition of feudalism, the unification of the laws and the rules of weights and measures, the standardization of the gorge of carts, and the uniformity of the character used in writing, all of which had lasting effects in Chinese culture. So Li Su was kind of an important figure, even though he wasn't the dominant one. So it was actually Li Su that proposed that the emperor ordered all historical records other than those of the Qin dynasty to be destroyed so that history would begin with his dynasty. This is all instigated because Li Su perceived the threat posed to a uniform rule by divergent schools of political and social thought. Hence, he proposed to make such thoughts and ideas inaccessible to ordinary people. His basic objective was not so much as to wipe out these schools of thought, completely but to place them under governmental control. This is actually a very detailed story, uh, I can do a whole video on it but if you're more curious and now then highly recommend a, a paper that I've listed down below which explains it in quite a lot of detail, it's really interesting. So if you want to learn about ancient Chinese burning of the books down below or just ask me and I'll make a video about it at another date. However, the reason I discuss this incident is to emphasize how vulnerable texts were in the ancient world. You know, if one person had an idea to eradicate history, they could do so very easily due to the fragile nature of the text as a physical object and their limited existence. Libraries could protect books from nature and human error like losing one, etc, but they couldn't always uh, protect them from imperial power. So when did archives become libraries? Well, to find the oldest library, we have to go back to Ebla, one of the earliest kingdoms in Syria. The Royal Library of the Ancient Kingdom of Ebla, circa 2500 to 2250 BCE, was discovered by Italian archaeologists in 1974, who found approximately 2,000 complete tablets, 4,000 tablet fragments, and over 10,000 chips and small fragments. Now this is what makes it interesting, is because unlike the other ancient archives that have been found up until that point, the evidence these archaeologists gathered at the site suggested that the tablets in the Ebla library were arranged by subject, and the tablets showed evidence of early transcription of texts into foreign languages and scripts, classification and cataloguing for easier retrieval, and arrangement by size, form and content. Thus we see this kind of shift away from storage and casual archiving to purposeful archiving with precision and organization. And we actually have to remain in Syria for the second oldest known library, which is the Ugarit Library, or rather libraries. The city of Ugarit was a late Bronze Age metropolis in early biblical times, and the library is believed to have been built circa 1400 to 1200 BCE. When the Ugarit archives were discovered in 1929, archaeologists found more than one library, including a palace library, temple library, and two private libraries belonging to diplomats. The libraries contain diplomatic, legal, economic, administrative, scholastic, literary, and religious texts, and at least seven different scripts were used, including Egyptian and Luwian hieroglyphs, and Cypro-Minoan, Sumerian, Akkadian, Hurian, and Ugaritic cuneiform. Now, before archaeologists found these two libraries in Syria, they thought that the oldest library was the Royal Library of Ashurbanipal, which was in Assyria in part of the ancient Mesopotamia. This library was founded sometime in the 7th century BCE for the royal contemplation of the Assyrian ruler, Ashurbanipal. Located in Nineveh, in the modern-day Iraq, the site included over 30,000 cuneiform tablets organised according to subject matter. Though Nineveh was consumed by a fire circa 612 BCE, the clay tablets stored within the library were baked harder and are now amongst the best preserved documents of the Mesopotamian history. Now, before the discovery of the library by Austin Henry Layard in 1850, almost everything we knew about ancient Assyria came from the stories in the Bible or classical historians. However, this library gave us access to the Assyrian voices telling their own stories, from court intrigues to hymns and prayers, medical handbooks and king's deeds. Ashurbanipal had this fantastic library because he was somewhat of a different ruler. You know, while the other kings of his time had led armies across the land through multiple campaigns, 
a Shilpa Neeple uh, was kind of a homebody who loved to write. So much so that the carved reliefs depicting him within his own palaces depicted him with a stylus in his belt. A Shilpa Neeple was also most interested in understanding the gods, so most of his texts in his library reflected this interest. And many of his tablets actually bear a library stamp of sorts, stating that the tablet is from his collection. So he actually loaned them, which is quite generous. I don't know to whom, but he did. <laughs> I don't. And finally, let's start on one ancient library here as an example, because we can't go on. There's a lot of ancient libraries, but we have to discuss the Library of Alexandria, the most famous library in classical antiquity. So following the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE, control of Egypt fell to his general, Ptolemy Fersota, who sought to establish a centre of learning in the city of Alexandria. The result, the Library of Alexandria, became the intellectual jewel of the ancient world, containing between an estimated 40,000 to potentially 400,000 papyri, and potentially more. So classical sources provide only cursory accounts of the library, but the most detailed account we have comes not from a Roman or Hellenistic author, but from a Byzantine scholar, Johannes Zetzes. Zetzes tells us that the Alexandrian holdings were collected in two separate libraries, one outside the palace and the other within it. The outer palace, he claimed, housed 42,800 papyrus scrolls, which he calls books very casually, and the royal collection consisted of 400,000 composite rolls and 90,000 single rolls. So that's a lot of rolls. How did the library get so many papyri? Well, there are a few accounts, and the most notable comes from the Greek medical writer Galen in his commentary on the third book of Hippocrates, Epidemic, explaining how the copy of the Epidemics that once belonged to the physician uh, Nemon of Cide came to be in Alexandria. Galen recounts that the Ptolemics issued an edict ordering all ships arriving at a port to be searched for books that might be aboard them. If any books were found, they were immediately confiscated and copied. The originals were then added to the collection, whilst the duplicates were then returned to the owners. In a more dramatic case, the Ptolemic inquisitiveness also turned against the state whose own production constituted the great part of its holdings. The Athenian authorities permitted Ptolemy III to borrow the manuscripts of the dramatic works of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides to reproduce them in Alexandria. But once transcribed in Egypt, the copies were then sent back to Athenian state archives whilst the originals joined the Ptolemic collection. The library's goal was to house all the original texts it could possibly find, and then also translate barbarian texts into Greek. Over the years, the library evolved and contained not only Greek works, but the works of the Elamites and the Babylonians, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans, the Syrians, the Romans, the Phoenicians, Indians, and the Persians. However, as you can probably imagine, an interesting byproduct of the collection scheme was selective alterations and forgery. <laughs> Forgers began penning works, claiming that they were by great classical authors, and as Helen Rosen says, by virtue of the destruction of its acquisition method, the Library of Alexandria facilitated the falsification of the, the tradition it aimed to conserve. The library made it possible to betray the past in the very gesture by which it aimed to remain faithful to it. And with the most implacable inevitability, it exposed its own text to the chance of being ruined in the moment it acquired them. So what actually happened to the library? Well, technically, it's not actually certain. You know, Plutarch writes that the library was burned to the ground when Caesar intervened in the Egyptian political struggle in 47 and 48 CE, when he sided with Cleopatra against her brother, Ptolemy XIII. Plutarch says that the library caught fire when Caesar retaliated against Ptolemy's attempt to cut off his fleet by using fire, which burned the dockyards and spread to the library. The story of the library burning is reiterated by a second century report by Orleus Gellius, 3rd century Dio Cassius, 4th century Ammianus Mercellius, and 5th century Orosius or Orosius. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that. So we can tell that the library story kind of went through the centuries, but there are witness accounts of the battle and the fire that don't mention the destruction of the library at all. In his History of Rome, Florus recalls Caesar's use of fire, but he doesn't mention it affecting the museum or the library. And in the Civil Wars by a P in Alexandria, we read of the various battles around the palace, but nothing of the flames that destroyed the archive, which is a curious thing to omit from a witness. Moreover, Seneca, Dio, Gellas, and Avrosius, who do discuss the effects of the fire on the collection, speak of burning not of the library, but simply of the rolls. And it has been pointed out that the destruction of the collection storehouses does not necessarily imply that the archive itself was destroyed. Additionally, Alexandrian scholarship 
didn't end after the Civil War, which one would think it would if the archive had been completely destroyed. Yet we still have contributions from later scholars such as Didymus, Trifion and Theon. So more modern scholars are actually starting to lean away from the idea that the library burned during the Civil War. In a discreet, pointed and altogether exemplary example, Bertrand Hermendinger furnishes powerful evidence for the survival of the library well beyond Caesar's mythical flames. The literary evidence for its afterlife, he recalls, is strong. Strabo remains silent about the fire in his report on the museum 22 years after the war. Suetonius, born circa 69 CE, bears witness to the existence of the Alexandria Museo under the reign of Claudius between 41 and 54 CE. And Suda makes references to a member of the museum in the time of Theodosius I, who died in 395. Hermann Dinger also cites the publication in 1948 of a non-literary document of a singular weight, an Oxyringdus papyrus recording the sale of a boat in March 31st, 173 CE, which is addressed to none other than a certain Velius Diodorus, vice librarian, member of the museum. So what actually happened to the library if it didn't burn down with Caesar? Well, Hemendinger notes that a number of events could have ultimately caused the destruction of the library. Given that the reign of Theodosius marked the beginning of the exposure of the city to vandalism, the possibilities are many. The only one to be excluded, on both documentary and literary bases, is that of the great disaster, the one that is too well known to be recapitulated, the involuntary flame that was kindled by Caesar in his own defense. So I hope you enjoyed this wee video about the introductory to ancient libraries and how ancient libraries kind of started a whole movement. We, the history of the library is very long. We have to go through so many centuries to get to the libraries we have today, but I thought that was a nice taster of a few ancient examples and also kind of how it evolved from archives to libraries and the earliest libraries that we know of. This video was brought to you kindly by my Patreon. So thank you so much to all of my patrons for making this video possible. I cannot do this work without you and I genuinely really appreciate you. If you enjoyed this video and many more, I'll be uploading videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays tend to be actually more classics and ancient history related and the Thursdays are a bit more casual normally. This is the kind of exception, we're shifting into that realm. Thanks to my patrons supporting me. I can only do this shift for that with your support. And if you're watching to the end, remember that on Fridays, I actually live stream over on Dorian. I'll be doing that tonight. And there's a new writing prompt that has just been released. So I'll link that all down below, all the details. So please come and join me over there. Tonight, we may be doing a threesome story. I'm just saying there may be a threesome scene. Please join me tonight at 8 p.m. GMT if you're interested. And I will see you on Tuesday for another video. Except Patreons, I'll see you this weekend for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.